Welcome everyone. Good evening. And thank you for joining us for this event, which we are entitling Welcome Encounters, Mennonites and Muslims in Central Asia with John Sharp and Sophia Samatar. My name is Audrey Voth Petkoff, and I have had the privilege of working and traveling with Tour Imagination for many years. We are a Canadian travel company that has helped North American Anabaptists explore their heritage for more than 50 years. Tonight, we are excited to explore a lesser known story that happened in the late 1800s as Mennonites migrated from Russia to Central Asia. Tour Imagination offers a tour related to this gripping story that is full of tragedy, punctuated though by moments of hope and triumph. Before I introduce John Sharp, the historian who leads our Silk Road Odyssey, the Trek to Central Asia tour, I will tell you what we will be participating in during the webinar this evening. After I introduce John, he will introduce Sophia. Then Sophia will read from her memoir, The White Mosque. Following the reading, John and Sophia will discuss the historical trek to Central Asia featured in her book and how it relates to her own personal story. After the discussion, there will be a time for Q&A. So throughout the webinar, please post your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom right of your screen. I hope you can all see that. Okay, now I will introduce my friend, co-leader and travel companion on many past tours, John Sharp. John is an author and retired historian who taught at Heston College in Kansas. He is a former director of the Mennonite Church USA Historical Committee and Archives. He holds a Master's of Divinity degree from the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary and has 15 years of experience as a pastor. Since 2000, he has led various tour imagination heritage tours to Western Europe, Prague and Poland, and Central Asia. He is married to Michelle Miller Sharp, who sometimes co-leads tours with him. Their family includes two living daughters and four grandchildren. Sadly, John and Michelle's son, MJ, was abducted and murdered in the Democratic Republic of the Congo while on a mission for the United Nations in 2017. John has written a book about MJ's life and legacy. All right, please welcome John Sharp. Hello everyone. I'm very pleased to be with you tonight. Uh, this uh, story is so exciting. And tonight we are privileged and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sophia Samatar, uh, the author of The White Mosques that probably every one of you have read. She holds a PhD in African Languages and Literature from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she specialized in modern Arabic literature. She's the author of A Stranger in Olandria, a fantasy novel exploring themes of travel, exile, and the conflict between oral and written ways of knowing. She's a nonfiction and poetry editor for the online journal Interfictions. She's interested in world literature, African literature, fantasy and science fiction, feminism, and all strange and subversive <laughs> forms of writing. Uh, before going back to school for her doctoral degree, uh, Dr. Samatar lived in South Sudan and Egypt for 12 years. And there she became proficient in Arabic. Well, uh, let's let's go right. Well, let me. I should show you a picture of Sophia, as I often saw her on the 2016 tour. 
she was forever taking notes. She wrote everything that she saw and everything she heard. And I learned that she is an amazing researcher. Okay, before I go on and on, and we don't have time to read all the awards Sophia has won. So let's go straight to Sophia. Sophia, welcome. John, if you can just stop your screen share. Yep. There I am, thank you. Um, thank you so much, John. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank you, Audrey and Sandra for, um, for arranging this event and for inviting me um, to share and to talk with people who are um, who are interested in this piece of Mennonite history that I myself um, was very unfamiliar with when I was growing up. It was something that I only discovered as an adult. And when I did uh, find out about it, I was absolutely fascinated and began researching it and began writing about it. And then found about three years into my research that lo and behold, there is a Mennonite heritage tour of Central Asia, where you can actually follow the path of these Mennonites who came from Southern Russia, um, what's now Ukraine, to Central Asia in, um, in the 1880s. And so I knew that I had to take this trip. And, uh, and that trip um, was the foundation for my book, The White Mosque. And so I'm really excited to be here and especially to talk with John, who, um, was my leader when I was on that trip, and as we later discovered, is also my cousin. <laughs> These are things that happen to you, right? So um, I do, I'll, I'll, I'll read just a little bit from the book. Um, some of you may have read it, some of you may not have read it, um, but the way that it begins is that I'm in Tashkent, we've just landed, and I'm about to take this trip. And the book um, is written in, an, in very kind of short sections, so I'd like to read two of those sections for you. Um, one of them is just the very first one, sort of the first page of the book to set the scene. And then the second one um, goes a little bit more into um, the reasons that brought me on this trip and how I became so interested in this, um, in this historical event. So here's how it starts, the White Moth. And the first section is called Begin with the Glow. Begin with the glow, the faint beam of a half forgotten history. In this darkened hotel room, a trace of ochre outlines the curtains. Push them aside and a fawn colored radiance blooms against my arm, revealing the city below, the dust and juniper trees the loops of traffic. The light seems to flow from the streets as much as the sky, a tint in the air, less a brightness than a universal softening of the atmosphere. It appears to have no single source. It arrives everywhere at once, from all the ends of the earth, from the future and the past. Rumpled sheets silky patterned walls, a decorative chair in the corner, rigid and remote like a lady in waiting. I've traveled before as a tourist, a student, a volunteer English teacher, but never for research, never as a pilgrim. Outside, a bus called Golden Dragon, tree trunks painted white, the heat of June and the vastness of Tashkent, its miles of tended parks, the giant mosques that seem akin to the lonely Soviet structures, buildings marooned in the sky, much taller than the trees. The larger everything is, the smaller I feel, the more I sense the glow. 
My insignificance brings me close to stray, discarded things, to the story that brought me here, to this blade of grass I pluck by the statue of Amir Timur, the conqueror, guarded by angels, born with his fists full of blood. So that's how the book opens. We're in Tashkent, the bus is there, we're ready to go on this trip, um, but why? Um, so I'm gonna read one other section before John and I start our conversation um, that, that gives sheds a bit of light on that. And this section is called Beautiful Error. What brought me here? In a way, I've arrived by accident. I'm haunted by a little piece of history, the story of a small, hardy, stubborn group of people who traveled here more than a hundred years ago. I am haunted by a photograph of their church, blanched with whitewash, standing among the poplars of an arid village square. When I first saw it, I imagined its thick walls were made of crystal, that its surface would taste of salt, and that it could contain more than was physically possible, like a word. Because I saw this church in a photograph, I felt I could hold it in my hand. Because the photograph was a century old, I felt I was holding my century, the one in which I was born, the 20th century. Because the church was located in Central Asia, in what is now Uzbekistan, a place I had never seen and of which I knew practically nothing, I felt it was very foreign. Because the church was a Mennonite church, belonging to my own denomination, the faith tradition of my mother's family, I felt it was very close. To be very close to the very foreign is one definition of haunting. As the most prominent landmark of the village where it stood, the church in the photograph gave the place its name, Akhmachet, the White Mosque. To the local population, largely Muslim, the church was a white mosque. Beautiful error, radiant mistake. Whether one is Christian or Muslim or neither, churches and mosques form nodes of powerful feeling. Ashtons cluster about them. Some perceive them as violently opposed, charged in such a way that they must repel one another. Others would place them together as representatives of the same monotheistic, extremist, world-conquering impulse. But whether you see the forces these places emit as wildly different in character, generating worldviews that can never touch, or whether you see them as unified at a deep level, amplifying one another in a sizzling sibling rivalry, or whether your opinion partakes of both notions, I'm in this electrical storm. My mother's family are Swiss German Mennonites, my father's Somali Muslims. I stand amid this lightning, which here in the 21st century, only seems to be growing more intense. And so I wished to go inside the church that was a mosque, its simplicity, its almost blinding pallor. The church crumbled decades ago. It no longer exists. A pilgrimage then to error, to ghosts, to the accidental, to the glow. And that's the end of that section. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sophia. Um, what a wonderful way you have brought so many strands together into a single braid. Um, you have received rave reviews from east to west, from the New York Times to the LA Times, and everywhere in between. Uh, so congratulations for your very Thank you. good work. A question. In the story, who is Frank? 
<laughs> this is the best place to start, a very important place to start. We want to get this clear right away. Um, Frank, who is the leader of the tour in the book, is John Sharp. So in case you were wondering if you've read the book and you said, I feel like this guy with the beard and the kind of tweedy professorial look and all this energy, it really seems like John Sharp. That's who Frank is. I've had a number of people uh, guess that, that that was me. Have you? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and you spoke of hauntings in your reading. What place was most haunting for you? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think for me, my mind immediately goes to um, the mosque in um, the village, which is now called Kok Ota, which um, the Mennonite travelers knew as Sarabula. Um, that mosque, and this is this is a small place. I think one of the reasons it really struck me is that many places we went on the tour were very big. I mean, we, you know, because part of the tour, it's the Mennonite journey, it's also the Silk Road, right? So you're seeing these fantastic, you know, ornate buildings, and mosques and madrasas in, in Samarkand, in Bukhara. But this village mosque is off of the tourist track. Um, and it was a place where, um, when this group of Mennonites were on their journey um, and they were really struggling, you know, they were, they, they were, they were wanderers. They were, they were sort of um, lost. They were stuck. It was winter. They needed some place to stay for the winter and they were invited to stay in that village and to use that mosque um, for church because the folks in the village said, you know, we're using it on Friday. We're not really doing anything with it on Sunday. If you want to use it, you can go ahead and use it. And also several families slept in that mosque. And when we went to this village, um, a descendant of the Imam who had welcomed them was there to welcome us. And that was really powerful. And it was a, there was a real, um, strong sense of of history being in that place even though the building of the mosque itself of course this is a very long time ago so it's been so rebuilt that you know it's it's i don't know if there's a single brick from the building that those those people were that those mennonites were in but it's on the same site it has the same shape um and so yeah that was that was that was really powerful for me. What, what about you? What would you say, John, a, a haunting, you know, most haunting place? Well, the, the moment that comes to me is when we were in um, the descendant's house, uh, who is himself a merchant, and he was talking about his ancestor, who was a car camel caravan merchant. And he told a story that I had never heard in five trips. And mm -hmm. that is, that when the Mennonites left in the spring, his ancestor sent them away with gifts and money. I said, why? He said, it's the teaching of Muhammad. It's the teaching of the Quran. It's also Uzbek hospitality. We just do such things. I was moved. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. I also remember that he wanted to kill a sheep for us. And we were like, please don't kill the sheep. <laughs> we don't have enough time to stay and wait for the sheep to be cooked and eat the sheep and we don't want to eat your sheep please don't and they didn't and they just gave us fruit and it was a wonderful fruit and incredible bread and incredible honey and it was it was really wonderful yeah but he extracted from me a promise that in a future tour we would stay there all day for the killing wow. of the sheep the fatted goat okay and the playing of traditional games so we're going to do that on our next tour. Oh my goodness. All right. If you're going on this trip, get ready to eat some meat <laughs> because <laughs> they will, I mean, I that will be a big deal to them. That's really great. Yeah. Yeah. He's been waiting now for what four years and I haven't gotten back yet. Right. But right. We're trying. Because yeah, yeah. And we plan yeah. to this fall and uh maybe next year too. Fantastic. There's a question I've uh, been posted. 
uh, has either of you been to the other colony, Auliata, now called Bakai Ata, formerly Leninapol? My grandfather grew up there. His parents mm -hmm. moved the family there in 1900 for a job. Yes, I was there briefly. My first tour I led in uh, 20 or 2008, um, I thought I could do everything. So I explored that colony as well as Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan and uh, it was far too much for so little time. But yes, I was there. Um, another one, all of the 40 plus founding members of the Herald Mennonite Church near Bessie, Oklahoma, except two, were veterans of the Mennonite trek to Central Asia. Hmm. Wow. Uh, that's the only question I see. I thought there had been more. Um, so, um, when you were writing your story, um, you uh, focus on Klaus Up Jr. Um, when in the tour, I think we focused on all the other leaders and less and less on Klaus Up. Um, did you use him for dramatic effect? But actually, you know, my recollection uh, of the trip and my notes show that as we um, got closer and closer to Hiva and to the site of Akhmachet, um, there was more of a focus on Klaus F. Jr. because so many of those other leaders had either died yeah. or they had left. They yeah. had gone, you know, some of them had gone back to Russia, some of them they'd gone different places. And so um, the way I express it in the book is that, you know, Epp did not gain, he didn't necessarily gain followers, but he lost detractors. In other words, the people who had been other leaders who had been in opposition to him, you know, sort of disappeared in these various ways. And so by the time the group reached Akhmachet, um, his uh, his hold and his authority was 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 very strong by that time because um, there there weren't uh, as many of the the people around anymore who had been um, yeah who had been sort of maybe balancing him out or who had been yes. you know leaders of groups that didn't even really know him you know because there were there were a variety of groups that that dovetailed together right in order you know they were from different colonies in Russia and so. Certainly at the beginning of the trek, he was not, you know, the leader. Um, but by the end, by the time they got to Akhmachet, um, he really was. I understand. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And and finally, he was, uh, he was excommunicated from the main church. And it was, in the end, only uh, him, his wife, Elizabeth, and some of the children. Yes, yes. And, you know, the community was actually extraordinarily patient with him i think anyone would say yes. they gave him yeah. they gave they put up with a lot put up with a lot before yes. they finally said look you know we can't we can't let this guy yeah, preach they anymore did. they did yeah yeah uh, one of the primary leaders martin clausen died as they were leaving yes. ebenezer uh, mm -hmm. so he would have been uh, one to focus on um if we had gone to his grave if we could have found his grave Right, right. Here's a question uh, from Rebecca Jensen. Uh, there are a lot of unfinished threads in the book. Your father, the photographer, can you say more about how these tie into the overall haunting feeling of the book or how you picked which threads to include in the book? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, so one of my... Um, I'll just say characteristics is that I tend to want everything. I want everything. I don't want to leave anything out. 
And this um, has, you know, had a couple different effects on my life. It's the reason that when I wrote my dissertation, my topic was world literature, because I want everything in the world. And um, it's the reason that when I began writing fiction, I wrote epic fantasy, because I want that big, broad canvas, and I want, you know, to kind of write about a whole world. And I had the same approach um, to writing The White Mosque. And in fact, I address it very directly at one point in the book where I say, you know, I don't want to leave anything out. I feel like if I leave something out, I will have somehow, you know, been false to the story. And so, you know, the answer of how did I decide what to include? It was really like, you know, I, I, I don't think I ever asked myself, you know, how do I decide what to include? It was like, how do I decide what I can bear to leave out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and there were, you know, um, a few things that I thought might be in there at one point that I, that I didn't wind up putting in. But I would say, you know, by and large, I'm happy with, um, I'm happy with the amount that I was able to put in. My approach to the material was very much like, yes, and. Like, yes, and I will include something else. Yes, and I come across the story of, you know, Irene Worth, who is this, you know, um, very famous stage and screen actor who's a descendant of the people on this, uh, on this journey. So I'm going to write about her. Oh, I find that, you know, Langston Hughes was in... Um, was in Uzbekistan in the 1930s. Well, there's going to be a chapter on him. So each, um, I, 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 my impulse was really to be, to be open to the material and to be open um, to what I would, to what I would find. Now, how do the threads tie together? You know, some of the links are very clear. Some of them are a bit thinner, a bit more tenuous. Um, so I think maybe there are varying degrees of sort of um, space for a, for a reader to to play with those threads for themselves and see, you know, where do you as a reader think that those things might connect? Um, Erica Friesen, I'm wondering about the languages you spoke on the tour. Did you use your Arabic anywhere? What other languages did you encounter? Um, well, this is a, a an incredibly um, linguistically rich region. Um, so there are there are lots of different languages spoken there. The major ones are Uzbek and Russian. I do not speak either of them. Um, we had wonderful um, Uzbek guides and translators who were with us on the trip and and. Um, who were also, you know, especially one of them who's, um, who is himself a historian, um, was a fantastic, you know, just fountain of information in order, in, in addition to being kind of a leader and, uh, and a translator. So we, that's how we, we managed. Did I use my Arabic a tiny, tiny bit um, in, in speaking with this, with this historian who was traveling with us? just really in little things like, you know, um, working out the spelling of his name. You know, he, I asked him how he spelled his name and he was very uncomfortable with, um, with the, the Roman alphabet. He didn't want to use that to spell his name. And, and he finally wrote his name um, in my notebook in Arabic and was like, you know, when you see it in Arabic, then, you, then you'll know how to pronounce it correctly. Uh, another question. Um, why did Klaus Epp lead this trek? And before you comment, I'd like to say that uh, Irene Plett, who is doing brand new research and translating of sources uh, re related to the story, um, he writes an article saying Klaus Epp was not a leader. Um, he became fanatical. He was on the fringes. He made himself the center when he really wasn't. Uh, so there's that discussion again. And I would say that in 2007, a shout out to Sharon Eicher and Jim Yonke, who led the first exploration tour in this region. 
they came back with remarkable stories. Stories we had, stories we had no idea about, south of the border, that is. Canadians, of course, you knew about this. You knew many more things than we did. But that tour opened up the Mennonite world, uh, at least some of us, uh, to that trek, to that region. And it's been uh, very rich. And those who go on the next uh, tour uh, will be blessed with new primary research by Irene Plett. Well, I'm looking forward to sharing her good work. Uh, Gary Smucker, the future travelers will have a grand collection of the great Trek stories in one place. The White Mosque, thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Roth, Sophia, your book raises so many profound questions about identity, community, and the complications of hospitality. At one point you write, hospitality isn't enough. What's needed is the transformation of a home into an alien place. Can you reflect a little bit more on what this means? Yeah, that's a, I mean, a lot of the book is, um, is, is very much um, in praise of hospitality. The hospitality that um, the Mennonites received when they were on this journey, when they were very, very vulnerable, very weak as a community and homeless, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I pay a lot of attention to how wonderful and how important hospitality is. And I, and I believe that. However, um, the, the, the host guest relationship um, has its place but as you know, a model for relations over time, it also has some weaknesses because a guest is never really at home, um, right? You don't welcome somebody into their own house. Uh, and so that's why I came to this idea of trying to flip, you know, rather than saying, oh, you know, I welcome people, I welcome people into my home and this is my home, this is my place, this is my territory. Um, my idea was to flip that around and say, well, is this really, is my home really my territory? Or am I also, was I also at some point welcomed here? Was I, was I also a stranger at some point? And certainly, you know, um, for a great many of us uh, in North America, we can say, yeah, I was at some point a stranger. I was, somebody in my family, somebody in my past um, came as a stranger. And I think that there's something powerful about reflecting on that. And it's actually one of the things I found most powerful in learning about, um, about this story um, to, to reflect on one's own people as strangers, as wanderers, as refugees, um, as needy people. I think um, it, it, it can change one's idea of, um, of ownership, of ownership of a place. Mm. And I think it gives us a more um, open, healthier, and I think more accurate um, perspective on on the idea of home. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, spoke about and wrote about a certain photographer whose grainy films you watched for hours. Tell us about him. Yes, um, this was Khudaibergen Divanov was his name. Um, and he was, um, so he lived in in the um, in Hiva in the in the area the, the Khanate or the, the province the part of of the country where um, where the Mennonites settled and he was a pupil of um, William Penner um, who was a photographer who was on that who was on the trek and. They met when uh, Khudaibergen was young. I think he was only about 12 years old. 
Um, and he learned to use the camera from Penner, who eventually gave this boy a camera of his own. And um, and Hodaibergen Divanov is known as the father of Uzbek photography. He was the first indigenous um, filmmaker and photographer in the region, not only in um, what became Uzbekistan, but in Central Asia as a whole. And he produced the only images, still and also filmed images of, um, of Central Asia by an indigenous photographer in pre-Soviet times. So these are extremely, I mean, this is an extremely important to the history of, of photography and film in the region. And it's the reason that, again, following that sort of yes and, you know, yes, I'm going to write about this too. Um, in the White Mosque, there is a chapter, there is a section on um, Central Asian film. Uh, would you tell us more about the interaction between the Mennonites at Akhmachet and the villagers in Kiva? Um, they had an interesting relationship on uh, multiple levels. Could you reflect on that? Yes. Yes. And I, I would love for you to chip in on this too, John, because I know that you're very, that you're really an expert um, on this, on this history. Um, because really what, what I'm saying is like stuff I heard from you. <laughs> you know, going, well, I remember you told us, you told us this. So that's what I, and I wrote it down in my notebook and that's how it got in my book. Um, but, you know, my understanding is that this was a, um, this was a harmonious relationship. It was an amicable relationship. Um, there were many um, people, um, I, certainly Uzbeks, but possibly others, Tajiks. I mean, there were a lot of different different kind of ethnic groups that were that were around in the region um, who worked um, for the Mennonites. And um, I believe I remember you saying that the Mennonites were considered to be fair people, that they were considered to give fair wages um, for one's work. They had a they had a respect for work and they paid for it fairly. Um, there is also um, the interesting story of a of a relationship, a marriage between um, a man from the Mennonite village and an Uzbek woman that we heard on our trip. Um, but we only heard of we only heard of one. So it's heard not, of a second, you know, you've heard of a second one? Okay, so this is one of the things that I that I was saying um, in the book as well is that this history is ongoing. There's there's more documents coming out, there's more information. So tell us about the second one. What was the second one? Well, I don't know much about it. I just heard um, someone who um, knew the story, but hadn't yet written it down for me. But the first story uh, it was, was fascinating in the way that it was uh, confirmed. Um, I was in the region doing research and um, I was staying uh, with a family, uh, a Mennonite family up north toward Hanover. And I asked at the dinner table one evening, there is this story, which the people in Akhmetchit didn't want to own, because Mennonites could do nothing wrong. So I said, you know, I heard a story about a man uh, who married an Uzbek woman. Could that be true? And the grandmother of the family who was 80 something said, that was my grandfather. Yeah, yeah. And when we were in Akhmetchit, there was one of the either the, the headmaster of the school or his brother, because the two of them um, are kind of local experts on on the Mennonite story. And so they met us there in the village. And um, and one of them told us that the, that the woman outlived her husband by many years and that he had seen her. Hmm. He had actually seen her when she was a very old woman. Interesting. There's another so, version of that story, but uh, maybe enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, someone is asking, can somebody do a brief review of the track for those who don't know the story? That's for you, John. <laughs> Go ahead, historian, resident historian. Beginning in 1880, five wagon trains of some 900 plus Mennonites from two Russian provinces had a vision for moving eastward. Uh, it's where the second coming of Christ would happen. They were going to get ready for it. It would be a refuge from all those fleeing from the Antichrist, who, by the way, lived in North America. Um, and it's a, such an intriguing story about a vision and what propelled them. So they go eastward, don't know exactly where they're going. At Tashkent, uh, they separated into two groups. One group went to Ali Alta and the other to uh, Uzbekistan and eventually um, Lausanne and Kiva. Um, and so most of what those of us, like I said earlier, south of the border knew was the Klaus Epp story that was uh, fanatical. But we have learned a much broader, bigger and better story of how Mennonites uh, had a productive community uh, and their relationships with Muslims uh, for 50 years before they were finally deported by Stalin in 1935. That's a wonderful summary. And I and I like your emphasis on, you know, the 50 years, the 50 years. That is what I really think is most powerful about this story is not, you know, that they thought Christ was coming and they had this big disappointment and and all of this. But the fact that after the disappointment, they didn't leave. They stayed there and they made a life in this place. Mm -hmm. And that their um, their time there has remained um, important to people in Uzbekistan today. And that was one of the things that really blew my mind was the interest that people in Uzbekistan take in this, you know, fringy group of German speaking people who mm -hmm. set up a village here for 50 years and then got deported. I mean, that, you know, I was amazed at how much interest there is in that story in Uzbekistan and the fact that there is even a Mennonite museum in Hiva, which I believe yes. is now open, John. It is, is that open. Right? It's a big deal. It's yeah. state of the art. It's wonderful to tell the Mennonite story. Yes. Um, there's so many more things to say. Uh, what would you like to say at the end? Um, let me read a final question. Sophia, uh, Mary Ellen Meyer. I'm finding this a delightful read. I'm just about at the end. As I have read, I have argued with you about some of your theological and historical statements. I have laughed out loud at many passages, such as those about our magpie existence and the way you expressed your feelings about the lack of an apostrophe in the martyr's mirror. I have been charmed by your gift of using words to express the way we all, as human beings, struggle to make sense of who we are and who we are meant to be, and to help us feel a bit the wonders of this trek. My question, how do you explain that this book, so full of Mennonite culture and history and angst, has become so popular with people who are not Mennonite? Do you think they put themselves uh, in their place? I mean, I really, I have to say I have been surprised. I have been gratified. Of course, I'm very happy. Um, I do believe that it is, that this is a story that has a lot to say to, um, to all kinds of people. But I am surprised at how that actually has, has transferred and has reached people because it is extremely niche. I mean, it's Mennonites in Uzbekistan. It's a very, it's like for many um, people, you know, that would be two things that they almost haven't heard of. It was, it's just, it's like a, a weird thing and another weird thing. So, um, so I have been quite surprised. Um, and at the same time, I think, you know, if I try to account for it, if I think, well, what is it that makes it, um, 
have broader appeal. I think that um, one thing that I've that people have said to me is that you know it's a book that is um, a personal story, but it also speaks to broader sort of you know global um, phenomena. So, so it speaks to um, to you know colonial history. Um, but in a personal way, and to you know traditions of romanticism in travel writing, um, but again with sort of a personal take that makes it that makes it accessible for people. Um, people have been interested in the way that you know the book addresses photography and the uses um, that that photography has been put to, um, both positive and negative. That's a you know that's a general topic. That's a topic that anybody um, can get interested in. So I think that you know that those are things that at least those are things that people have said to me um, that they found interesting about the book. But yeah, I'm I'm a, in some ways I'm as surprised as you are because it is a very <laughs> I see it as in some ways one could call it a narrow subject. But again, as somebody who always wants to put everything wants to have everything and sees a lot of connections between things, I do think that you can start anywhere. You can start anywhere. You can start from your backyard and you start making connections from there and you will connect to the whole world eventually mm -hmm. because everything is entangled and embedded in each other. So, you know, of course, the, you know, it, it makes sense that there would be a way from this very small particular story um to you know much bigger and broader things mm -hmm. um i know we're about at the end and so sandra sandra you'll have to stop us when we are finished yeah i think it's uh, nine o'clock is it isn't it is it nine o'clock that we're going to yes that's right you know. guys are good uh, to keep answering questions fantastic okay great um, David Clausen asked uh, what I learned or come to understand for or came to understand for the first time in reading your book that had never come into focus for you during the five tours that I've led. Everything is connected. We see this story often as a, an isolated event of a group of people uh, that, uh, you know, who knows what happened to them. But we are all connected. We're connected through the story of the 1880s through 1935. Uh, there's a greater story also in uh, Auliata, the second settlement, that lasted longer, much longer, uh, until 1993. Um, so there's so much. Um, and it's not isolated. It's not out there. It's our story, and we're all connected to it somehow. And you do that so well in your book. Thank you. Well, and I think, you know, it is also a book that is not by a descendant, right? I'm not a descendant of yes. these folks. Yes. And so I think it's also, you know, for me, um, and that was something I was very conscious of. And one of the reasons that I, that I did work so hard on the research and try to be extremely careful um, with this story, which is, which is not my own, which is a story that, that, um, that kind of galvanized my interest, um, but is but is a story of others, um, and you know, it, it is it is still a story. It's a story that spoke so powerful, so powerfully to me that I believe it had to have something of value um, to offer to the world. And I think you know, um, I think that I think that the the reception shows that that's that that is true that other people have seen this that this is a that this is a valuable story to yes. tell and retell and expand right because we're still getting i mean there is still so much that is unknown and i remember john even on our last night when we were about to leave hiva um you were sitting there scrolling through your phone, uh, you know, and there were these PDFs and these were documents that were just coming to you, like documents that had just been translated, that had been, you know, in, in 
some Soviet archive or something that had been sort of, you know, inaccessible and were now becoming accessible and now getting translated. So that process is still happening. I think there's a lot, you know, a lot still to be learned about this story. There is indeed. And two sources I'd like to mention, I already said uh, Irene Plett continues to do uh, her amazing research into this story and the people. Also, Walter Rotliff, who was on the first yeah. tour, the Iker and Yankee tour in 07, has written a book and a video. Uh, so those two, Through the Desert Goes Our Journey is one of them. Walter Rotliff, if you search his name, you'll come up with his resources. Yeah, yeah, Pilgrims on the Silk Road is the name of his book. Yeah. Um, and if you want, you know, mine is a personal kind of travel narrative. If you want a history, just a straight up, you know, here's the history of what happened. That is a fantastic book. I leaned on it a lot um, in writing my own. It's really, you know, a, a tremendous work of, um, of research. If you want the history, that's the one. Yeah, here's a question from Tim Penner, who's been on two tours. I'd like both of you to reflect on the quote you, Sophia, have at the end of the book. The point of healing pilgrimage, Walter S. Friesen writes, is not to close the book, but to keep it openable. All right, who's going first? You go you. first, Tom. Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you first. Okay. Um, well, I love that quote. And I should say that one of the wonderful things that's happened to me after the book has been published is that I was contacted by Walter S. Friesen, who wrote that essay, who is in his 90s, and found that his essay was quoted in my book. And we connected on Zoom and had a wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. It was really, um, it was really great. And I love that that quote about not to close the book, but to keep it openable. I mean, isn't that just yes and? That is the, the open and the um, ready and the curious stance in which one says, you know, the story is not finished. Even when there is a book, even when you can say, mm -hmm. I wrote a book and you can hold the book, it's it's still it's still something that can be opened. It's still a history that can be returned to. It's growing. It's alive. Um, and to keep that in mind is um, it's a way of um, I mean it's a it's a it's a humble stance, isn't it? It's a humble stance toward the material. It's it's a stance that says I am not the owner of this material. I am not the expert. I am not. I'm not shutting it up and closing it down so that now we're finished talking about it. I've said the last word on this thing. It is about um, a participatory relationship to the story that we are all, all the stories are connected and we are all storytellers and there's always something more um, that can be said. It also leaves it open for other stories to be told. Other writers, other storytellers to tell us more. Uh, you've given us a wonderful foundation, and Walter Rotliff, Robert Friesen, another one, uh, a German writer, uh, has written this story in detail. So there's room for more. Uh, yes, and let's not place. forget Dallas Weeby's um, Our uh, Asian Journey, incredible novel about the story. Yeah. Um, if you want to work totally. with fiction, yeah, Our mm. Asian Journey um, is is a is an approach um you know as a as a historical novel yeah yeah, yeah. it's a wonderful book a question from norman epp who was john on before you go on i would just say you can take about one more question where um we just need a little time for audrey to close up okay uh norman epp great great grandson of class my question is, have either of you examined how the Great Trek impacted the North American Mennonite church? Uh, traditionally, the story concerns the drama around Klaus Epp. The leaders who left the Trek impacted North American Mennonitism considerably, possibly with millennialism exemplified in our recent history. 
Well, I think that is, um, I would pass that to the historian. I mean, my, my um, research was very much in, you know, bounded by the kind of time and place of the existence of the village of Akhmachet and was focused on that area. But John, have you, um, is that something you've looked into? That's a very, it's, it's a very interesting um, direction. Um, we have been impacted by millennialism for a long time, ever since the Reformation. And uh, the bad story in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so we are not exempt from fanaticism. It's all around us, it's been in us, it's been with us. Um, those who returned from the trek earlier um, had less good to say about it because they left during a very terrible time at Lausanne where everything was stolen. Um, they, they were, their cows were stolen, horses were stolen. And finally, when uh, Heinrich Abrams was killed with a sword, by Turkmen's who wanted to take his wife, then that was the last straw. That was enough. Um, so there's that skeptical story from the um, origin of that uh, return. Um, but we we continue to grasp for uh, maybe conspiracy theories or maybe something that looks so exotic or something we don't know about, so we fill in the story. We do our eisegesis, we pour in the meaning into the story. I learned that word from you on the trip. Okay. <laughs> uh, anonymous attendee, how Mennonite were the people on the trek or was this simply an aberration? Hmm. Well, I, and I know we're getting close to time here. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I will say my, my reaction as, um, you know, my personal reaction as a student of this, um, of this history, initially, I really felt that I wanted to sort of hold this at arm's length and say, oh, you know, this is not me, you know, and I, I couldn't imagine, you know, my family, my Mennonite family, kind of getting on board with this with this story of Christ is coming on March 8, 1889, and so on and so forth. And I and I really wanted to hold it at a distance. But um but I I I felt in the end that maybe that was not the most use, useful um perspective and that it was more um it was it became more important for me to sort of acknowledge the ways in which we are all connected, the ways in which the same strands of thought and the same stories inform me as informed um, this group of people. Okay. So, you know, we are we are not really we are not really that distant um, from each other. I think this was not an aberration. Um, millennialism was on fire all through Europe. Everybody was reading the novel of Jung Stilling, and uh, it caught fire. I think we must be at the end. Audrey is appearing. <laughs> uh, she is. Sophia, I want to tell you that someone in the group tonight said that he was a friend of your father's, and he graduated a year before him from Goshen. Oh, wow. Well. He says, you were just a baby and many things have happened since then. And if you had anything to say about this, it would be interesting to those who became part of the Mennonite community as foreign students. I'm sorry that we don't have time for that, but I thought you should know that there was someone who said that. Thank you. Because I don't think you are reading the questions. Well, folks, we are at the end. Thank you, John and Sophia. Thank you for helping us explore this one Mennonite story, um, the heritage in Central Asia. It's a great story, but as I said, it has so many dynamics to it. Sophia, we are grateful for your time and your insights from your book. Indeed. You much continued success. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Yes, and thank you all of you for coming this evening. Now, if you want, if you haven't read the book and you do want to purchase the book, uh, there should be a link in the chat. Can you all see that? Have we put that there? And also, if you would like to travel with John on his next tour to experience what we've discussed tonight, to be in Uzbekistan yourself, which is a thrill, I'll tell you, there are still a few available spaces. Probably after tonight, there won't be many, but there are still a few now. So if you go to our website, it is the Silk Road Odyssey, the Trek to Central Asia Tour from September 17 to the 30th this fall. And then hopefully we will have another one listed for next fall. And there should be a link there where you can see more information. It's been a delight. Thank you. It has. And good evening. Thank you to all. Thank you. Bye-bye.